I want us to, uh, first of all, I want to welcome you all, of course, to church this morning. And as you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at uh, first principles, second principles, and the character and characteristics of Father God. And what we've been attempting to do is to put them in their proper perspective and right order so that we can pr proceed on from there. And of course, I'm on next week's message, so I know what's coming. And it's all good stuff. Amen? So uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again we come before you thanking you, Lord, for your spirit. Thanking you, Lord, for the word. And the word has power that is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing us under bone and marrow. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the power of the word entering into our lives today and transforming us and changing us into the image of Christ. And we thank you for it, Lord, in his name. Amen. So in closing last time, we were looking at and closed with the definition of true judgment as we'll encounter it. And if you remember, in the Greek New Testament, as we study judgment, we need to understand its true meaning. Now, what does it say in the psalm? It says, judgment and justice are the foundation of your throne. But the thing is, that word uh, justice can also be translated and transposed as righteousness. Now, as we said last week, justice has no um, verdict, or, uh, verdict or condemnation in it. Remember I spoke about the Old Bailey, I believe it was, in England, where they have the woman on top of the Old Bailey with a blindfold on and a set of scales. So justice is blind. But we've done terrible things with, with that particular first line of that psalm. Justice and judgment are the foundation of your throne. So now in gaining of our understanding of the definition, we'll need to realize that judgment in and of itself doesn't have within itself any particular verdict or action. Judgment itself, so justice and righteousness are the foundation of your throne. And justice does not have within it any particular verdict or action. The most common words then that we're going to be seeing and encountering going forward, they're going to be Greek words, there's three of them. It'll be the Greek word crisis or crisis which means that of an opinion or a decision given concerning anything, especially concerning justice and injustice or right and wrong. Now the question was, we asked last week, in that definition do we see any punitive or retributive suggestion there? Or for that matter, any verdict given there? No, we do not. So what we heard in the word crisis or crisis, K-R-I-S-I-S, -I -I is that of an opinion or a decision given concerning anything. So the second word then that we're going to see and use and look at over the next few lessons is the word crima, crima, that is K -H -R -A dash M-A-H, which means a decision or a decree. Now, both of these words are rooted in one Greek word, and that word is krino. Krino, K-R-I-N-O. Which itself means to pick out, to select, to choose, to decide. So again then, are we seeing any assessment given to those three words that is talking about a penalty? No. 
These then, these three words and their meanings, these will then will be the platforms that we'll be using in the coming messages in helping us in our understanding of judgment and justice or righteousness are the foundation of your throne. Remembering then that the word used there for justice, as I mentioned, can also be transposed as righteousness. Now, within Christianity, we already have these words, judgment and justice, planted within us. So in reading the word judgment, when we read the word judgment, we are programmed to hear something more. Now, we're content with hearing these words as long as they don't interfere or meddle in our own lives. I.e., the word judgment, using the word judgment. Now, when you hear that the 401 is at a standstill and you're heading east, would it be? Yeah. We decide to take Highway 2 around the congestion. And we do that we're exercising good judgment. Now, we use the word judgment in that way, or we say, that was using good judgment, or that was bad judgment. Using the word then there, as in making an assessment of a situation, right? So we quite accept readily those definitions in the use of the word judgment. But you know what? The moment we come into church, the moment we come into church, judgment then takes on a completely different complexion and hue and mutation. Taking someone, taking on somewhat of an angry, retributive posture. The moment then that we enter the church, the word judgment takes on a new meaning that it didn't have outside of the church environment. So within the church, we use a different filter in exercising or executing the word judgment. Now, we mentioned at the top of this message that judgment doesn't suggest any particular verdict or action. Those biblical words that we looked at in the Greek suggest that a decision be made upon the evidence. Upon the evidence. To make a decision or to issue a verdict. This is all that they mean. They don't mean anything else. So, in joining the word judgment, with a penalty or reward is to error or make a miscap miscalculation right from the beginning. See what I'm saying? So in hearing the word judgment and then allowing our minds to run in a particular direction other than to make a decision or to decide is to use it in error. Now we put it this way because modern day Christianity has assumed that decision and verdict, listen, that decision and verdict have both been granted synonymous status. So anger and wrath then have also been given synonymous status, which gives credence once again to retribution, hell and rapture. Now, this is where I'm going to shake your tree. Are you ready? I'm going to shake your tree. <laughs> you can't or won't be able to find any reference to the word rapture within church li literature within the first couple of centuries. There's no mention of a rapture within church literature within the first couple of centuries. 
they, the early church, listen, believed in the kingdom of God. They believed in the kingdom of God on earth. Listen, on earth as it is in heaven. Think about that. We say it every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Translators later translated that to mean rapture. The early church then believed in something totally different than that of escapist theology. If the eschatology that were, were being promoted, if that eschatology that's being promoted were true, then we'd all want out of here right away. We'd all want to be raptured right away. But what we have to understand, body of Christ, is that the early church rightfully believed that when Jesus Christ came, he established the kingdom of God on earth. And what does the scripture say about being absent from the body? <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Faster than the wink of a sunlight bubble. You ever seen the wink of a sunlight bubble? It's gone. Faster than that. So, what the early church rightfully understood was that when Jesus came, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and started moving about the earth, Within the kingdom, he was, moving within, he was moving upon the earth within the kingdom. Where did he say the kingdom was? Where did he say it was? He said it is within you and it is at hand. In other words, it's all around us. Doesn't the scripture say we are surrounded by a herd of elephants? We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Right? So, we must begin to see then that every one of these eschatologies are the fruit, listen, of a false initial premise that has been elevated and presented to us as first principle. So let's begin to look at some possibilities of justice that haven't or aren't commonly considered by judgment advocates. Everybody understand what I mean by that? There are lots of denominations out there that are justice advocates. It's got a mean spirit to it in some, some places. So, just from a natural perspective, but in realizing that the things that we're going to look at from a natural perspective are displayed, listen, they're all displayed in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing new under the sun. Think about what can happen in a courtroom when a judge is called upon to make a decision or issue a, ver a verdict. And we just looked at those three Greek words, did we not? So let's look at some of the things that we never hear coming from the judgment advocates. Things like dismissed, case dismissed, you've been exonerated, you are innocent. You've been exonerated, awarded damages, given custody, assigned property, redistribution. 
all of these, in a sense, can be turned into something that is evidenced in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, can they not? How is it then that when we talk about judgment, the judgment of Father God, that we don't think of innocence? That we don't think of innocence? How come when we think of the judgment of Father God that we don't talk about these other things? Why? Because we've been taught to think unforgivingly and punitively and judgmentally. That's how we've been taught. Why is that, do you think? Well, because justice, justice and judgment and or holiness have been exalted to first principle status. What he is God's first principle? Love. Yes. So emanating then, these things being elevated to first status, principle status, they then begin to emanate their own assumptions based upon their elevating, elevation. Thus you won't Listen, you won't be able to stop their rulings once we've accepted their first principle status over that of love as first principle. What will happen then is that we will be embraced, wrapped by these assumptions that flow from our making them or elevating them to first principle status. I hope you can see that. Can you see what we've done by doing that? And all of the issues that flow from those decisions in making our lives fearful, in making our lives resentful towards Father God? Well, if that's your God, I don't want to serve him. I want nothing to do with him. See that? So what we need then is for us to begin to cast off these erroneous assumptions as we begin to understand all of our erroneous decision-making. And that's not to cast out the Father God. That's not to cast out that Father God is just. With judgment being a key issue in his kingdom. And he's relating his sonship relationship to man. What then are we to do with these? That are part of his character and his nature. Because we know that justice, as, part, as well as righteousness, are the foundation of his throne. So what are we to do with these parts of his character, of his nature? Well, once again, we're going to have to filter our thoughts on these and other matters through the filter of his Father God's love. Thus allowing his love, thus allowing his love, thus allowing his love, not us, to define these secondary characteristics. What then does it mean when we say filtered through his love? Are we saying, let's run it through the test of the love chapter? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. That might be a very good idea. But listen, once again, that's just the letter. That's just the letter. Right? But now we have to make the application of this too. Why? Because some of the things we know, some of the things we know, we fail to make application of them at the right time. We're famous for it. Famous for it. Remember, to know and not to do is what? Really not yet to know. 
Otherwise, we'd be doing it. Right? I'm telling you, boys and girls. <laughs> if I had the keys to my brand new van, I would be driving it. Right? But I don't have them yet. So I can't drive it yet. <laughs> so, body of Christ, <laughs> this is what we're saying in filtering all of this through Jesus. We have to filter it all through Jesus, the filter of God's love. You know, I've said to you many times, I believe, over the course of the years that we've been here, that when I was at Generous Motives, and I would be challenged with really challenging situations and questions, if I didn't have the answer right away, I would say to that person, well, let me sleep on it, discuss it with the Holy Spirit, and then I'll bring you the answer. Because I wanted to, I wanted to run the answer through the filter of Jesus in God's love. I didn't want to give them an answer that came out of my head. I wanted to give them an answer that came from the Father through Jesus. Thus making Jesus and Jesus alone the definition, listen, this is good. Making Jesus and Jesus alone the definition of judgment and justice. We'll need to carry this with us, body of Christ, for and into the eternity of the eternity. Because we're not going to live in the eternity of, eternity of the eternities in anything but love. You know, if you don't have love, you're a sounding brass. If you don't have love, you have zip, 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 zero. And what we have to understand is, for us to live in the eternity of the eternities, we have got to understand the first principle. And everything we say and everything we think and everything we do must be run through the filter of God's love before we thunk it or say it. Right? So, as we saw over in Psalm 89, 14, that judgment and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne or of your kingdom or of your reign. And again, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.11, I'll let you turn there, rather than me just quote it to you. 1 Corinthians 3.11. This is most important, body of Christ, that we begin to see this. Jesus alone is the definition of judgment and justice. And in 1 Corinthians 3.11... For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is there already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Amen? So righteousness and justice are the foundation. Okay? You catch that? And Jesus Christ is the revelation of righteousness and justice, isn't he? He Christ, listen, he Christ is all justice and all the judgment of Father God revealed. It's already been revealed in Jesus. All of Father God's justice, judgment, righteousness has already been revealed in Jesus. He is the one who characterizes the reign of Father God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So one of the other things from one of the other translations 
speaking about Psalm 89, 14, the latter part of that verse is that loyal love and faithfulness characterize your reign. This is uh, Psalm 89, 14. We were talking a, a couple of weeks ago about other translations of the latter part of that verse. And one of those is, loyal love and faithfulness characterize your reign. Meaning that Jesus alone, Jesus alone is the definitive expressed revelation of love. And therefore, of every characteristic of Father God. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it all begins and ends with him. And all of these years that have been wasted in erroneous first principle, second principle, and third principle, and we're all getting mixed up, forgetting the first principle, God is love. And when you finish writing, turn with me to Colossians 1.18. Hallelujah. Isn't this good? Colossians 1.18 just solidifies what we've been saying and looking at. Are you there yet? Colossians 1.18 tells us that he is also the head of his body, the church, seeing he is, the, he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first and be preeminent. Now the question is, would all things, listen, would all things include judgment and justice? holiness and righteousness? It would, wouldn't it? So as we've just read in Colossians 1.18 that Jesus has the preeminence in everything and in every respect. Now, just flip over to Colossians 3.11. because it amplifies it a little bit better and more for us in so, in so much as first Col first Col yeah, Colossians 3.11 tells us that Christ, Jesus, is the all and in all, everything and everywhere to all men without distinction of person. He, Jesus, is all in all. That means that Jesus is all judgment, all justice, all holiness, all righteousness. Listen, in all. So help me God. Amen? <laughs> Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Sorry? Colossians 3.11. See that, body of Christ? So what have we done over the centuries with justice and judgment are the foundation of your throne or the foundations of your throne? We've run off erroneously in the wrong direction. And what we've done is we've painted a God who has no heart, no feeling, no empathy towards the things of man and the plight of man. 
And if you're not here tomorrow night, please order the CD. Because I've got some more revelations for you that will rock your socks. So how many of us are waiting for the rapture? When the kingdom's already here. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, the translators and theologians within, I think it was within the third and fourth century, start, started to come up with the escapist theology of the rapture. When you're dead, you're dead. Right? <laughs> and if you're in Christ, when you're dead, you're with the Lord. Faster than you can take your coat off. Or before you could even fall to the ground. Or even before you could close your eyes. Or the light goes out in your eyes, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. 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 And Pastor Helen was saying, just re referring to when we went to Australia and, and my brother David, he, he counted it his part of, uh, you know, blessing the family that whoever came to Australia, to Western Australia, he was the one who picked us up and he was the one who took us and distributed us to where we were going. That was his job. He was the eldest. He saw it as his responsibility. So when we arrived, the last time we were there, I think it was the last time, yes. No, was it not the last time? Okay, the last but one. Oh, the last but two? Okay. When we arrived there, <laughs> he was always at the bottom of the escalator, and I was looking for his face. Little did I know he was 20 yards that way, gone. And as we came, as Pastor Hal and I came down the escalator, they were running in with screens. So we couldn't see him. But you could see he wasn't there. That when we finally asked for him to be paged, once I mentioned his name, they said, oh, come with me. And they took me into an office and they told me that he had died of a massive heart attack 20 minutes before our plane landed. So they wanted me to identify his body. So, of course, I went to see him, lay there, and there was nothing in his eyes at all. He was gone. I said, do you mind if I close his eyes? You're right, Mary. Do you mind if I close his eyes? And the priest said, no. So I closed his eyes. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. No. Nope. So rightfully dividing the word of God, this is one of the things we talk about in navigators, we've lost the ability because of these elevating these secondary and third principles to primary status. We've lost the ability to rightfully divide the word of truth. So we have to get back into digging into the word of God with the pedagogue, the Holy Spirit, who has been sent to teach and lead and guide us into all truth. Amen. Did you get something today? Yeah. All right. Lots to chew on. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Father God, you wow us every time with your word, with the logos and the rhema contained within your word. So we thank you, Lord, until we come back next time. Lord, that you'll seal this in our spirit. You'll seal this in our hearts. Lord, and you'll cause us to meditate on it and chew upon it so that we get the revelation, the realization, and the acknowledgement of everything that we have heard this morning and we'll begin to rightfully divide the word of truth given to us by you. We thank you and praise you for it now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. Amen? Okay.
Could somebody switch the camera off for me? Thank you. Thanks, George.